for the Philippine Cancer Center where I got some of my treatment. They asked me to be part of a campaign and uh, I've been here to make a stop whole campaign to kind of help people through their cancer experiences. <coughs> and it's all part of why I'm doing this. We're going to skip through all that. Okay, so we're going to get right into the preventative um, piece. There's three pieces to an active shooter um, approach. There's the prevention strategies, there's the response strategies, and then there's the aftermath. The best attacks are preventive. Ultimately, we want to try to prevent an attack before it ever happens. Because once an attack starts, we are um, reactive versus pro proactive. And I'd like to tell a very quick story about how one person can make a difference in preventing a uh, major attack. Show of hands, has anyone in here ever heard of the Fort Dix terror attack? Okay, I'm surprised that's a lot. Uh, so, I, was, I just want to clarify, so, oftentimes people confuse you with the Fort Hood terror attack. Fort Hood was down in Texas. Um, Fort Dix is in New Jersey. So, what happened to the Fort Dix terror attack? It was a preventative attack that never happened. I was there as a combat instructor during the time that this was happening. Long story short, there was a domestic terror group that planned, plotted or planned an attack against American soldiers at Fort Dix. One of the guys was a pizza delivery right outside the base. His dad owned a pizza place. He was gathering intel for months. They knew all the Troop movements, times, schedules, locations, had it all planned out. They were acquiring um, rocket launchers, automatic weapons, had a plan. What happened was they took their film to get developed in a certain circuit city in either uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey, or Mount Laurel, New Jersey, right in that area. And a young employee at Circuit City observed the photos, thought they seemed a little strange, called law enforcement. Law enforcement turned it in to the FBI. The FBI was able to get somebody on the inside, and all the way up until, not exactly sure the time frame, but basically either days or a week before the attack was going to be carried out, the FBI took them down, and that attack was prevented. Had that attack occurred, there would have likely been hundreds of military members that were killed, because Fort Dix is a training ground, and most of the people who are in training don't have weapons, so we would have been able to defend ourselves. Um, it would have been a slaughter. So don't ever think that one person can't make a difference because you can. And especially in today's day and age and world like we're going to talk about, I'm going to teach you and show you what you need to be looking for, especially with social media. How many of you have some kind of social media where you're familiar with social media? Okay. I mean, it's today's day and age, right? You're going to be surprised to know that over 93% of all attackers post that they're either going to carry out an attack or something to the effect of threatening behavior directly before they do finally uh, attack. So we're going to go through this preventative piece. Uh, this is a, a timeline, essentially. The blue line is all the time we have to prevent the attack before it actually occurs. Things that occur during this time, communication on social media, people being expressive about violence and their intent to carry out an attack, purchasing or acquiring weapons, talking about weapons, um, scouting, coming in asking questions that would be out of place about how many people are in the services, what's the biggest service, and this is what we have to tune into. Now, I have very specific verbiage that we're going to go through. But again, with us being a church here, it opens us up to a lot of different attackers, right? We have religious extremists who could target us for the symbol that the church stands for. You have people that may harbor ill will be, to the church whether or not this particular church, uh, in their mind, had a wrongdoing, whatever the case may be. Or if somebody comes here for help and 
they don't get the help that they want, or they feel that the church has outcast them and they're not giving them money, whatever the case may be. Those are all things that people hold against the church to carry out attacks, in addition to all the extremists, terrorists, etc. So there's a lot of different people that would want to hurt us in this setting. So we need to be aware of that. Once the attack starts, obviously, that's the most dangerous. And this prevention timeline could be days, it could be weeks, it could be months, or it could be years. So we can't really predict what the trigger point is. You know, I can't say that somebody who's expressing certain behaviors is definitely going to carry out an attack. I can't predict when that trigger point is going to be. But when you start to see these things, you need to get law enforcement involved or, you know, all of you need to come together, have conversations with supervisors. Um, and I think we have created a security team. Is that correct? Okay. So that's what any concerns we're going to want communicated to the security team. And then when the security team feels, you know, we need to get involved, we'll absolutely. So that's our goal. Does everybody kind of understand this? All right. We're going to get into much more specific detail on that, but I want to start with that. All right. Start with that. Uh, all right. So let's, let's talk about this. Essentially, what we're trying to do is gather information if somebody is expressing um, extreme or dangerous behavior. We want to communicate that and get it into the hands of the right people. Assuming that fails, the next step in the process is to actually be attacked. So, here at this building, we need to have a plan in place so that whoever we're targeted and attacked, we can save as many lives as possible. So how do we do that? Well, the most important thing is layers of eyes, ears, and or some type of physical security or um, you know, individual security. For those that are at the doors, are you inside the doors when you're greeting people? Do you stand inside the doors? Yes. Okay. So what we need is the ability to sound an alarm or make a notification immediately if we were able to assess Right outside the building. One of the things that I do is I study churches in Israel because they're attacked more than any other place in the world. And so their security procedures are really some of the best because of the amount of times that they're attacked. Um, here in the U.S., churches are actually a targeted and attacked the least of all the different Areas. So corporate America is number one. Your businesses, uh, that's where most active shooters occur. Schools are up there in the top three. Churches have the lowest number. But I believe that, that and, and active shooters in general are rare. Attacks are rare. But I wouldn't get too excited with the fact that the church is at the bottom of the list because we're seeing more attacks in churches. I mean, just off the top of my head, have the Charleston um, shooting where Dylan Roof sat in a prayer group with a group of people for just under an hour, sitting there with them, and then uh, started shooting and killing them. Uh, you have the Texas uh, shooter. Obviously, we have the synagogue shooting here in Pittsburgh. We're starting to see a lot more targets um, in the churches. And the reason for that is they're soft targets, right? They welcome everybody. And there's a large group of people that are largely, um, you know, not protected. So that's why you're going to see churches being targeted. The best thing we can do here is to have a plan in place, try to secure whatever we can around the building, and establish notifications so that if there is a threat, we can immediately notify, and everybody has the ability uh, to respond. The more time and distance that we can create for people, the better chance they have to survive. I'll give you three examples. When it comes to proximity to threat, you basically have a threat outside the building, you have a threat at your front doors, and then you have an immediate threat, someone who will present a weapon in 
in the service, uh, in the group, whatever the case may be. That's obviously the worst case scenario, right? Because that's going to be an immediate response. All three are bad, but somebody who's in the group is going to present the biggest threat. And we'll talk about what to do in all those different circumstances. But that is what, as an organization, Tim and I, and through Tim, communicate to all of you what we're trying to establish, right? What you're seeing up here, as far as a company policy, <coughs> notifications, or alarms, that's what we're trying to get in place so that we can continue to prepare and train. Do you have anything to say on that, Tim, as far as where we're at with, you know, uh, communication or? So, so two, two or three things, one is I'm writing a manual so that we will we'll have a, a bullet that we can read through about all the work that is being done. The same thing is in terms of notifications, we opted in the short term for air horns, and we have one up there when we get up the wall. We tried them out. There were people that were bleeding out 
literally to die because they didn't get that help. If you have an arterial bleed, meaning your, your artery is uh, has been cut, and you have about one to two minutes before you'll likely lose consciousness and eventually you will die. So that is a critical time to where if you have a tourniquet or a quick clot or bandages that you can save someone's life. And that's a big part of this, right? A lot of times people focus in on one part of an active shooter situation or one piece, but this is a big <coughs> issue. We need to have uh, response ideas for everything. So we really need to get these kits and you can piece them together yourself. You don't have to go out and spend $80 while these companies try to rip it off because they, they know there's a need for it. You can piece these together. You can buy a tourniquet for seven dollars. We should have at least 25 tourniquets in this building. Minimum. And it should be spread out. And we need little kits, you know, quick clots. A um, quick clot, for those of you who don't know, you basically pour it in. Um, it's it's like a, it's it's like a material that you can shove into a wound. Stop the bleed training is offered for free. It's usually a 45 minute course. There are all kind of professionals in the community that would be willing to come and provide that training for free. Most people that receive first aid training now, they get stopped from lead training with it or after it. And it's a very simple course that could save many lives, okay? So I highly recommend it. Uh, anytime an attack like this occurs, there's a long-term impact on the fact that
we need to get guns out of the hands of the attackers. We need to, to solve this gun legislation issue. But that's actually a little misguided because the bigger problem is why are people becoming so violent, right? More people are wanting to kill large groups of people. That's really the problem we need to uh, focus in on. The gun legislation will, will benefit, have a benefit for sure, and it will help because we need to reduce the amount of ammunition that these shooters can have access to. But we're not going to be able to prevent an attacker from getting a gun. It's just not going to happen. Even with the best legislation, if somebody wants to get a gun and they can't get a gun, we're already seeing alternate methods. Uh, people are using vehicles to, to carry out mass casualty attacks. You saw it in these France. Um, you saw it on the London Bridge. You've seen it in the Barcelona attacks. Here we've seen it in the United States already a couple of times. So again, don't think that if we were somehow able to pull every gun in the world right now in the United States and remove them, that, that would solve the problem because they're just going to look for an alternate attack. So we really need to find out why people are wanting to kill uh, more now than ever. So that is our, is our study for our focus. In addition to all these things we're talking about, it really goes unnoticed that you rarely ever see this kind of information in the media. 157 homegrown terror plots uh, in the United States, 30 different states, since <laughs> 2013. And these are plots to attack, these are people coming from overseas, receiving financial support, communicating via the internet. All this stuff is happening here in the U.S. In New Mexico, in 2000, I believe it was late 17 or mid 18, we actually broke up, caught, and arrested the first known terrorist training camp that was specifically designed for school attacks. They were carrying that out here in the U.S. So there's a lot of bad things that are happening uh, here in the United States. All right. Continuing on with scaring you. Less than 70, or actually just under 70% active shooter attacks end in five minutes or less. One third of those end in two minutes or less. So what does that tell you? That tells you that this attack is going to happen quickly and it's going to be over, over you know, just as fast. So your safety and the safety of everybody in this building really comes down to our efforts here today. Law enforcement, likely in a building of this size, will have very little impact um, by the time we get notification and get here. Just if you go in Franklin Park, our average police response is three to five minutes. That is lightning fast. A national standard is like 15 to 25 minutes for a police response. And sometimes we broke the three minute barrier. You know, we, we responded um, in as quickly as one to two minutes. But one to two minutes of bullets flying in this type of environment is an eternity, right? That's the devastation. So this training and what we're trying to do in, in establishing this physical security, having a plan in place, Everybody being aware of their surroundings makes a difference. It really does. It's our best chance to survive. So 77% planned for over a week. Oftentimes, it's longer. <laughs> Observable behaviors. Uh, mental health is a big one right now. Problematic interpersonal interactions, both by violent intent. Those are all here, do we often have people that come with issues that they're looking to seek guidance, counseling? Do, do we bring people like that in?
You know, I mean, so as, as we go through, you're going to see the things that are red flags, and you're going to be able to relate to a lot of those. And, and that's why I'm asking, you know, I'm trying to understand, because when you start to see what it is, you're going to start to question, well, at what point do I report this versus not? And, oh, by the way, is this a protected conversation? Am I even So if somebody were to ever communicate a threat or you feel that somebody's life is in danger, you're allowed to report that. Even if it's a confidential, that includes um, doctors, any professional. If somebody verbalizes the intent to carry out an attack or hurt another person, you can communicate that and you should. So it's important. Now, Yeah. Uh-huh. 
So I spent quite a bit of time on individual response and how to overcome the overwhelming fear and um, physiological things that occur during an attack. And I'm going to go through it, you know, a little bit quicker, but we will cover it because uh, it's important. In the event of an attack here, I want to set you up for success and prepare you for what you're going to be exposed to and uh, what, what you can expect. So I'm just looking for one information to see. So just to cover some of those specific things before we get into response. Um, Two-thirds of the attackers from the 2000, this is, this is data from the attacks in 2018. So all the active shooter attacks that occurred in 2018. 67% experienced mental health symptoms prior to their attacks. Uh, those included depression, paranoia, delusions, hallucinations, and suicidal thoughts. Okay, so those are some of the, the areas of concern. In addition to mental health, you had a range of issues about white supremacists, anti-Semitism, conspiracy theories, sovereign citizens, animal rights, and insults. Have you heard of insults? Does anybody know what an insult is? I-N-C-E-L. Have you heard about that yet? It's an up-and-coming group. Anybody? So, insults are people, males, who are rejected by females. And they are forming these groups and carrying out attacks, mostly against women. So they'll literally target women. So these are guys in society who really aren't fitting in. They're not getting the attention of females. They can't uh, maintain relationships, etc. And uh, if you pay attention to that new Joker movie, there was a lot of concern when that came out because it was all about insults. And that's a big group right now that's up and coming. So they were, they put law enforcement across the country on high alert when that Joker group came out because they were fearful that there might be um, copycat attacks uh, for the insults. So just be aware of that. If you start to catch wind of that type of uh, information, it's out there. Uh, let's see here. A lot of domestic issues, ex-girlfriends, wives, um, perceived injustices, socio-political ideologies, you know, uh, political issues are a hot topic right now. There's a lot of people get very heated quickly um, on political issues. So these are all things that drive people to carry out. Increased depression, 
increased drug use, drug use is, a, is another concern, erratic behavior, purchasing weapons, threats of domestic violence, and acting paranoid. So those are the very specific signs. So you're probably sitting here thinking to yourself, well, how do I separate somebody who shouldn't use signs with somebody that I you know, think might actually carry out an attack? And there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer on that. That's why you have your security teams to come together and have conversations and then bring law enforcement in if you need to. Okay, so as far as during an attack, you need to have a survivor's mindset. You need to convince yourself that you're going to survive no matter what. If you get shot, you need to create in your mind that it's gonna hurt, or you're gonna continue on, and then you'll survive no matter what, right? It's not the movies. In the movies, you get shot, you lay down, you get a few final words, and then you breathe your last breath, and that's it. That's not real life, okay? If you get shot, and you can still move, and you're breathing, and you're conscious, then you're in the fight, you're running, you're hiding, you're, you're continuing to move. Don't allow the attacker to control the situation, because that's what they're expecting. They're expecting you to run away. They're expecting you to give up. One of the ladies in the Charleston church begged for her life, and the shooter shot her and killed her. Don't do that, okay? That's, that's These folks, once they engage in this behavior, they're there to kill as many people as possible. Uh, so we need to get a proper mindset. Options-based approach is all about the proximity to the threat. Your response and actions are going to be different depending upon where the shooter is. So is the shooter outside? Is the shooter right here? Is the shooter right next to me? We'll talk more about that. So you need a 60 second plan. This is part of what I developed through all my experience um, in combat, combat operations, SWAT, law enforcement, this is what I developed to help you survive. I already told you that most incidents are over in less than five minutes, with a third of those being under two. So that means that in the event that bullets start flying, you need to have a plan immediately. It already needs to be thought about and rehearsed in your mind at a minimum. Because Everything that you have not thought about or you haven't planned for creates time that your mind has to process what's happening. And it could take you up to 20 or 30 seconds to do anything in the event of a high stress attack. So first and foremost, you need to get control. Get control of yourself. You're going to start to have, obviously, physiological things. Your heart rate's going to increase. When your heart rate increases, it's our body's natural response pull the blood into the core. So you're going to lose the blood in your extremities, your hands, your feet, everything comes to the core because your body is trying to protect and keep all the vital organs functioning appropriately. Unfortunately, it also pulls blood from our brain. And so that's a problem because if your heart rate is too high, you're not thinking appropriately and making good decisions. So I'm going to teach you some different techniques to control this. You need to adapt and overcome immediately, whatever the situ situation may be. Gather as much information as possible. That's why we're trying to establish all these procedures ahead of time so that you can notify people and give them the most time to respond and to get to safety and to try to get to a place of hiding or to get out and exit. Formulate a plan and act immediately. So if somebody's approaching the front doors with a gun, what are we going to do? Are our doors capable of being locked? Can we lock the doors? Do we have tape on our windows to prevent the bullets from, you know, uh, breaking the glass and them being able to enter? Record, communicate, and leave. We're always looking for people for those things. You want to use situational awareness. If you ever find yourself in, a, in a, an attack, you have to pay attention to the environment. All right? There could be multiple shooters. There could be homemade explosive devices. So you really have to pay attention to what you're doing and where you're going. And your movements need purpose. And we talk about that a little bit more. But all your movements need to have purpose. You want to use cover and concealment, which we'll talk more about. So you're going to get a little weapons one-on-one. -on -one. Um, 
For weapons familiarization, I already told you that this is a semi-automatic handgun. This is the pre, uh, this is the weapon of choice. Semi-automatic means that every time you pull the trigger, a round is fired. So every time you pull that trigger, a round comes out of this weapon. These are the bullets that are commonly used. A handgun like this can hold anywhere from eight to up to over 20 or more rounds. Okay. Uh, in the top left, that's a rifle. It's usually referred to as an AR-15. Probably you've heard that term before. The bullets that it fires are directly underneath the bit. They're about this big. They will easily travel through walls. Um, your drywall, things like that. Closets, no problem. Brick walls, not so much. But any kind of a drywall, it'll go, it'll go right through. This one on the far right, that's an AK-47. That's an even bigger round, thicker bullet. So the right around will punch right through these walls, no problem. So you want to keep that in mind. Okay. These wooden doors might provide protection from the AR. An AK round will probably punch right through. The good thing about an AK is that they're really not being used. They have been used, but it's very rare that an AK-47 is used in an active shooter attack. We do see quite a bit of ARs, but again, the overall majority are the handguns. The thing to keep in mind about shooters, they're usually not very good with weapons. Their guns malfunction. They don't really know how to clear them. They carry multiple weapons for that reason. If one of their weapons go down, they have another one that they can resort to. Um, so just keep that in mind. But I want you to at least have a baseline visual and understanding of the capability of these weapons. So if I'm standing right here, I can shoot from here all the way to the opposite side of the building hit whatever target I wanted without a problem with the rifles. So, and there's a, you know, like a pretty moving line from where I'm at all the way to the opposite side of the building. So these weapons can reach out and touch something. You know, you have easily accuracy up to 100 yards with the rifles, with a handgun, 10 to 15 yards, give or take. Does anybody have any questions or anything up to this point? with a young girl, and he crawled on top of her, 
potential for that young man to crawl onto his girlfriend or tuck his, his girlfriend. How long could they have possibly been dating, right? And he did that to keep her safe. You can't predict what anybody in this room is going to do. But you should think about it. What can I do? What am I going to try to do? For myself, since I was 18 years old, I've been trained by some of the best military forces in the world for hand-to-hand -hand combat and weaponry. I'm going to break through the threat as efficiently as I can. Obviously, I can't just charge openly and become a victim, but my goal is to work my way through the shooting. That's what I'm going to try to do, uh, whether I'm on duty or off duty. Think about these things ahead of time. Are people carrying guns? You know, are you aware of people that come here that are armed? That's a huge topic that people ask me to address. Jason, should we ban or allow people to carry guns? Most institutions, places of worship, aren't addressing the issue one way or another. They're not banning people to carry weapons, but they're not promoting people to carry weapons. Um, you have a lot of law enforcement.